All right, uh, welcome everyone to first of two nights of grad talks um, with our January 2024 thesis group. Uh, again, please attend their reception, which will be um, next Saturday, the 13th, uh, 6 to 8 p.m., and we'll have the grad toast at 6 o'clock. Um, so just to give you an idea of our timing, each person gets 20 minutes total. Uh, so whether that's 15 minutes for the talk and five minutes for Q&A, as long as it's 19 minutes for the talk, one minute for q and I'm going to try to keep that really fair. So if you have additional questions for the speaker that you did not get a chance to answer, uh, ask them, please do that at dinner. I also want to invite you all to our Art Plus Everywhere event, which is happening uh, tonight at 7 o'clock right here. All right. So our four uh, speakers today is Audrey Pinto, Jenna Sellers, Jelena Felker, and Christy Stockstill. All right. Hello again. And thank you again. <laughs> Here we go. I often feel jealous of artists who are able to clearly and concisely summarize their creative efforts. I can't seem to do it, not the way some can, as in my paintings explore the intersection of X and Y, or my work is a reaction to blank. I'm not being glib. Whether the effort is made in service of a better world, for the expression of a personal belief or to explore the strengths and limitations of their medium, there is value in an artist's ability to communicate their creative goals and process with an audience. When I say that I feel envious of these artists, it is from a place of sincerity. But now my confession comes with this asterisk. I don't believe it is a requirement of the serious artist to be able to say or even know what their work is about, not from the beginning anyway. There is a series of lectures by the artist William Kentridge, six talks he gave at the Mahendra Humanities Center in 2012, entitled Six Drawing Lessons. In drawing lesson four, Kentridge says the studio can be characterized as a safe space for uncertainty, a safe space for stupidity, and this necessary stupidity is not the same as foolishness. The studio, he explains, is a place for following impulses that feel stupid without a destination. In my notes, I wrote, William Kentridge is my hero. I have returned to Kentridge for this brand of artistic wisdom several times since he was mentioned to me as someone whose work often incorporates photography and text. A quick Google search brought me to the six lectures, but in no way was I prepared for his expansive thinking and large-scale productions. Yes, he was working with text and image, but he was producing an opera for Pete's sake. Who was I to energize my thinking by the likes of William Kentridge? I watched the first two lectures and set them aside to refocus on photography. At the time, I was certain that whatever it was I was doing involved photographs, but unbeknownst to me, there was a little William Kentridge-shaped impression on my brain. When I started putting this talk together, I wanted to tell you everything, that I always thought I would be a writer, that I never majored in art, that I taught myself to use a camera and quit teaching high school English to start a photography business. That it took me 25 years to apply to grad school, and when I did, I almost applied to programs for creative writing rather than visual arts. How else can I show you how I got from here to here? How can I explain such a transition without recounting the details of the eight trips I made back to my hometown in Mississippi? I want you to know about Will and Indianola who helped me and my husband find our friend's grave, who asked us if we needed to find the black cemetery or the white one. I want you to know I have a trans daughter and that my trips back home included some great conversations but also led to arguments, some big ones that ended with me crying and packing my bags, deciding the whole effort was pointless. Each residency, I arrived with some version of my work in progress. A book, prints, archival documents, original poetry, fictional narratives, and family anecdotes. I tacked up lengthy bibliographies, pages of essays, articles, books, artist talks, documentaries, and podcasts, but I found it practically impossible to write a succinct artist statement. What I really wanted to write was I don't know yet. <laughs> because each semester I contacted my mentors and advisors expressed to them all the things I was thinking, rambled on about my confusion and uncertainty and asked for their guidance. I thought I must be missing something. Maybe it was obvious to them. 
Maybe they would just tell me so I could get on with the work. For years, I had been telling my husband I had business with the South. Not sure what that business was, only that I needed to be there and create there. I was born in Columbus, Mississippi in 1973, only a few years after the schools were desegregated, more specifically ordered by federal law to desegregate. My own parents were in high school at the time. Most of my family still live in Alabama and Mississippi, but I had become a stranger and I had no idea where to begin with this new work. During my trips, I photographed everything and everyone, convinced that the images would reveal my purpose to me. I made over a thousand photos of family, friends of family, landscapes, storefronts, bodies of water, abandoned buildings, signs, cemeteries, and churches. I made every Southern photographic trope in the book, but I still had no clear idea of what this business with the South was about. Was it about family, going back home? Was it a portrait of place of Mississippi? If so, what about it? its history, its people, the land, the culture. I wrote papers on the problematic nature of the archive and photographies coming up in the states alongside slavery, abolition, and, and civil war. The word untended kept coming to mind. And I began to see how it was possible that I was using my camera and my work as a way of tending. Tending to family connections, my aging parents and grandmother, tending to a lost relationship to my hometown and with it my understanding of the people who come from there, tending to erasures and omissions in Southern history, and finally the realization that my concerns were much broader than just the Southern part of the country. It felt daunting, even futile to return to Mississippi to make more images without a plan or at least a vague idea of what I wanted to photograph when I got there. But to have a plan would mean to have an agenda. I'd been so determined to remain open to possibilities. In looking for something, might I only find that for which I was looking? A critical characteristic of the photographic image is the fact that it is limited to what can be seen in the frame. Regard this, remember this, it says, as it implies that whatever is not seen is not of value. Likewise with archives, textbooks, museums, newspapers, magazines, tourist information. The gatherers and distributors of information decide what to include and what to exclude, and through their decisions they create and disseminate representations of the world as they see it or how they want it to be seen. To depict reality or the illusion of it is desirable and marketable. And there is still a tendency for photographs to be translated as literal or illustrative, making it challenging to depict complex or ambiguous concepts through photography. I wondered how this quality might affect the ability to communicate visually. Could a photograph communicate anything on its own? Do all photographs require the support of text? Given the manipulability of both image and text, is one form more functional than the, than the other in terms of relaying information? Or are the two stronger together? And if so, is that enough? I had done research, obtained documents and archival photos, discovered for myself how the omission of information or the intentional manipulation of it continues to do harm. But I was struggling to find a balance between art and information. Again and again, I returned to the images and my writing to find some way of organizing them, some clever presentation, sequence, or collage that would yield a powerful and persuasive case, an emotional and logical argument that communi communicated the need for profound change in this country. I had so many beautiful images, so much important information to share, and so much uncertainty. Back to my notes, back to my studio, back to Kentridge, and drawing lesson two. From a lack of confidence and action in the world and a retreat to the studio and the belief that in the recondite and unclear and ambiguous way, the work in the studio is still connected to these larger questions outside of it, which I could not solve. The large questions hover in the background, they enter into the studio in material form. What is pinned up on the walls of the studio? A constructed over-determination, an excess of material gathered to heat the image up, to provoke the making, to let making jump ahead of thinking. 
Today, it is common for people to encounter images as often as, if not more than, they encounter text. Images of devastation, war, and human rights violations appear in our social media feeds by the minute, folded in among the funny cats, pretty lunch plates, and women who just woke up like this. I began to question how information is received and processed in a fast-paced, digitally connected world. So naturally, I created a new Instagram account, one that would show many of the Mississippi images with detailed captions, facts about the US, Southern, and family history, and the strengths and weaknesses of photography. I planned to make the account public, but reconsidered. Creating the account was not meant to share all of this information, but to express the difficulty of doing so via a tiny algorithm-controlled platform. I thought maybe it would be more impactful as a performance or video of some kind. So I decided to record my phone screen activity as I interacted with the feed in the way we often do, looking briefly at some images, scrolling quickly past others, pausing to read some but not all of a caption. The result was my first timed piece. It's called Last Night I Dreamt I Couldn't Save You. And though it was a sort of smart aleck reaction to the difficulty of relaying anything of value through social media, it was honest and real, and it was the first time I understood what Kentridge meant by letting the making jump ahead of thinking. There are grave problems in this world, fueled by greed, hate, and the unexamined loyalty to anything, ideas, place, family, faith, which is stagnant if not destructive. I was frustrated by the inability of two primary forms of communication to hold the weight of the problems we face. Racism, immigration, homophobia, misogyny, threats to bodily autonomy, denials and erasures of history, banned books and censorship. These are not problems contained in any particular region of the country or even confined to the United States. At its core, this is a crisis of language. It's the attempt to stoke fear and hate through mislabeling, name calling, and scapegoating, and the willingness by many to use language to separate, belittle, and lie. In her 1993 Nobel lecture, Toni Morrison refers to such abuses of language, highlighting the policing power of sexist language, racist language, theistic language that do not permit new knowledge or encourage the mutual exchange of ideas. I thought all the trips, the writing, the research, the time spent with family, and making all those photographs would eventually tell me what this work was about. But it turns out that was the work. Feeling uncertain was productive because it kept me going, but don't misunderstand. I wanted desperately to know what I was doing and to be able to say it brilliantly. But in a thousand photos of family, old signs, cemetery swamps, dirt roads, and tattered American flags, I could say anything I wanted to say, and each time I tried, it felt wrong. I returned home from the June residency still uncertain about what I was really doing with all this work, but I thought I might be getting closer. It was something to do with the idea of identity as a construct, photography and language as tools in this construction, and who gains and who is harmed by these constructions. It was something about control of the message. What is communicated and how? For a brief moment, I felt happy, felt I was onto something. But then it was like, damn it. In my gut, I knew that the images I created did not match up with this realization. The work I needed to make now, it was not those photos. It was something else. There is an artist I've come to know recently named Jamila Sabor. She is a research-based artist who works in performance, sculpture, painting, video, photography, even neon. When asked in an interview about what it means to be a multidisciplinary artist, Jamila says she prefers to think her, of herself as a by any means necessary artist. I thought, yes, yes. And then I thought, no, no, there's no way. <laughs> um, in mid-August, I emailed Jan in a panic. I said, I feel like I am just now really grasping what the heck I've been doing all this time, and I've been working on something totally new that is not at all photographic. I think my work needs to expand, needs to move beyond photographs in some way, but I'm not sure how. I don't really have those technical skills. Is it too late to start new work? How do I write this thesis? <laughs> to which she responded in part, and I hope she's okay with me sharing this. 
You don't have to be in charge of what's happening in your work. It doesn't all have to be fully determined. Your work, your writing can be about doubt. It can be about not knowing. So I have, for now, set aside the photos altogether to focus on words alone. Although the work is still visual, something in the realm of sculpture, collage, and poetry, video, and installation. Each piece is an expression of the beauty and bias of language through cut and pasted words and phrases from novels, short stories, and poems, especially texts that deal with issues of race, gender, immigration, and religion. Exploring themes of identity, privilege, and structural inequality through the examination of language, which can build bridges as easily as barriers. This new space is exciting, scary, and rapidly evolving, and I'm trying not to worry about my inexperience with this new medium. William Kentridge opens Drawing Lesson 2 by describing the making of an opera, and I can't imagine ever being able to take on such a monumental project. But now I know I should at least take a step toward it, or if not a step toward opera, then at least away from standing still. Permit me one more pearl from Toni Morrison's brilliant Nobel lecture. Language, she proclaims, can never pin down slavery, genocide, war, nor should it yearn for the arrogance to do so. Its force, its felicity is in its reach for the ineffable. And I'd like to suggest that this is also the force of the artist. Thank you. you took in the South, and I was thinking about the sort of the on-the-road photography of the 70s, when photographers took, you know, cameras that were on the road and in, in, in sort of echoing Kerouac's on the road, this idea, and, and the idea of the camera as being a thing to use to make sense out of the world, out there, to understand it. it seems like whatever media you're working with, that's kind of what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. and whenever I would work with you, it would be like, you would have an idea of like the South, but you didn't know what you wanted to say about the South, and you know what had been said about it, and, I'm, and, and I guess my, my question is, whatever media you work with, is your goal to sort of use that to break it down into pieces and understand it? I mean, even with the language, it almost seems like you know, you're taking these little pieces of words that by themselves mean nothing and putting them together to try to make sense of it. I mean, is that your relationship to making art in general? I mean, that's what you said in the book. So, yeah, <laughs> so, um, yeah and you were, I mean, you were the first advisor who worked with me on this and um, and I when I had zero clue what I was doing and I was just like I'm gonna I'm gonna go try to figure this out but I didn't that's not how I worked in photography before I came to this program but I do think that art is a good way to making art working with ideas exploring them further digging in making mistakes figuring out something else out breaking it down putting it back together all of those are ways that we learn and I certainly did. And, um, and that's what I said when I said um, that was the work. You know, I thought that I was building this. I was going to make something with these pictures and I was going to say something about the South and it was going to be profound and change the world and things were going to be better and I was going to understand my family and all would be right, you know. But um, every time I tried to write down what I was doing, I couldn't say it all the way into word and image with Deb Todd Harris. Todd, Deb Todd, sorry, who's Harris? Anyway, um, I can't. <laughs> I can barely speak right now. Um, Wheeler, um, I had a moment of like, ah, I can't. I can't say it. There's no elevator pitch. I don't know. I don't know. And I was kind of freaking out because I've always thought you could trust the process. But the trust, this process came with a deadline and a performance. And I was like, oh my God, what if I don't figure this out? And then I got home and I wrote a draft of one thesis and I was like, this is not it. And then I wrote another draft 
I'm just like, that's not it. And I emailed Jan. She was like, what you just wrote to me would be a great beginning of a thesis. Just write me. And, and so I did. And so through writing, Joan Didion says she writes to find out what she thinks. And I, and I think, I was like, I think working through it, you know, as you're making decisions, you're like, oh, I think, I guess I think this, or I guess I feel strongly about this. And, and as I made those decisions, I was able to finally like kind of get to this point. And now there's so much more to do. <laughs> who has, who, you pick the questions? Do I, I call on people? You. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I love the Catch Ranch reference because there's so much of, of his projects where he was thinking, especially with the ambivalence of South Africa yes. and the nation there. And so um, the second thing I thought about is when Sally Mann gave the Norton lectures mm -hmm. at, at Harvard. Um, and, you know, she's working through things, she goes and tells stories, and it just becomes very meandering. And I wonder how much, like, this presentation is the piece in a lot of ways because even how you share the photographs and they kind of like gain visibility and then sometimes they're too dark and then they move on like that kind of elusiveness mm -hmm. I thought was really fascinating uh, and this whole thing feels like a book already or like a slideshow yeah. presentation um, and even us seeing you think and work feels like it should be in itself yes. 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 Yeah. thank you yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I have a question, and again, forgive me if, if uh, it's more of an observation, but I guess just two thoughts. One is that it feels like um, you know that general journey of, of doubt you know, in a world that so increasingly feels like it wants us to preemptively. I think that was on the list of 20, 25, like, qualities, yeah, yeah, yeah. skills and qualities, <laughs> critical thinking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, I knew that about you from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you.